The Pool of Narcissus, Walt Whitman's Homoerotic Poetics. Okay. On January 18th, 1882, in a Camden home in New Jersey, a 27-year-old Oscar Wilde was meeting his American literary idol, the 62-year-old Walt Whitman. At first, the two were joined by Joseph Marshall Stoddard, a popular Philadelphia publisher, but eventually Whitman desired more privacy with Wilde and invited him up to his den on the third floor, where the two talked for more than two hours. The press soon reached out to both writers to ask about their meeting. The next day, January 19th, Whitman told the Philadelphia press that he led Wilde up to his den so they could be on, quote, the and thou terms, end quote. When interviewed by the Boston Herald on January 29th, Wilde said that meeting Whitman was the closest he would get to meeting an ancient Greek figure. The meeting left such an indelible impression on Wilde that even after 1892, when Whitman died, Wilde was gossiping that he could still feel the, quote, kiss of Walt Whitman on his lips, unquote. Why was their literary meeting such a hot topic for the press? And why did both Whitman and Wilde describe their encounter in such sensual ways? To attempt an answer to these two questions, we need to first unpack why Wilde was so drawn to Whitman's poetry. In 1868, an Irish woman named Lady Jane Wilde had gotten her hands on the first British edition of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. The Victorian writer and critic William Michael Rossetti, who was part of the pre-Raphaelite movement, made it his mission to publish Whitman's American 1867 edition of Leaves of Grass. But getting his British edition, Poems by Walt Whitman, published came with difficulties. Rossetti turned to John Camden Houghton, a British, quote, publisher who specialized in Americana, erotic, and avant-garde poetry. And the two realized that Whitman's complete edition could not be published in Britain due to recent anti-pornography laws. Rossetti had a difficult decision before him, since he had to decide which erotic themed poems to cut out of his Whitman edition. Whitman called Rossetti's edition a, quote, horrible dismemberment of my book since half of his poems from the 1867 edition had to be cut out, including Song of Myself and the Children of Adam cluster of poems. Unlike the Children of Adam poems, which mention male and female sexual pleasure and reproduction, the Calamus poems celebrate the beauty and love of male-male friendship and comradeship. Rossetti kept one of the more male homoerotically charged Calamus poems from Whitman's 1867 edition, a song. Instead of keeping the original name of this poem, Rossetti changes it to Love of Comrades for his British edition. In the first stanza of the poem, the male speaker reveals his mission, which is to quote, make the most splendid race the sun ever yet shone upon. And I will make divine magnetic lands with the love of comrades, with the lifelong love of comrades, unquote. The speaker continues to explain that this new race he is creating can only happen if he is joined, quote, by the love of comrades, by the manly love of comrades, unquote. The model of male comradeship that the speaker is creating here can only happen through male-male love. The speaker desires to figuratively procreate with his fellow male comrades in order to make the most splendid race. While male and female erotic love had to be erased, because of Britain's new anti-pornography laws, male homoerotic desire, even one that offers a vision of the male speaker figuratively procreating with his fellow men is not questioned. When Wilde met Whitman, he revealed that his mother had read all of the 1868 poems to him. So Wilde would have been introduced to Whitman's vision of comradeship and its male homoerotic implications. During his meeting with the American poet, he told Whitman that once he left Ireland in 1874 to attend Magdalen College, Oxford in England, he brought Whitman's poetry with him. He told Whitman that, quote, he and his friends carry leaves to read on their walks. Before Wilde even knew that he would have the opportunity to, to meet with Whitman while in America, he was already living and breathing Whitman's poetic verse. <laughs> 
After Wilde graduated from Oxford in 1878 with a BA in classical moderations and literae humaniores, he was at a crossroads torn between becoming a classics professor at Oxford or Cambridge or earning his income as a professional writer. Wilde decided to pursue a career as a poet, and in the summer of 1881, Wilde published his first volume of poetry entitled Poems. <laughs> The British magazines, specifically the satirical one, Punch, on the left, responded to Wilde's collection of poems by mocking him as the, quote, aesthete of aesthetes. Wilde was quickly gaining notoriety in London's literary scene as an aesthetic poet who sought to propagate a new gospel of beauty. Soon after Wilde's poetry was published, theater promoter Richard de Oily Cart was in desperate need of a proponent of the aesthetic movement, a movement that mixed, quote, art, idealism, and politics, to give aesthetic lectures throughout America to promote the new production of Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta, Patience. Wilde's poems, well, was not as lucrative as he hoped it would be. So when, quote, de Oily Cart offered Wilde the opportunity to travel to the US, Wilde jumped at it to both receive a stable source of income and embrace his new ident identity as the Victorian aesthetic poet. Quote, on Christmas Eve, 1881, a 27-year-old Oscar Wilde wrapped himself in a fur cloak, boarded the SS Arizona at Liverpool, and set off to the U.S. for his 50-date lecture tour across the country, unquote. When the SS Arizona finally docked at New York City on January 2nd, 1882, the press was already waiting for Wilde to disembark so they could, quote, catch their first glimpse of the rare and wonderful English aesthete, unquote. Wilde did not disappoint. The New York World reported that he was wearing, quote, patent leather shoes, a smoking cap or turban, an ultra Byronic shirt, a sky blue cravat of the sailor style, and his hair flowed over his shoulders in dark brown waves, curling slightly upwards at the end, unquote. Wilde made quite the splash as soon as he stepped off the SS Arizona, and a week later on January 9th, he delivered his first English aesthetic lecture on the English Renaissance at New York's Chickering Hall. The New York Times critiqued his lecture and appearance as having a certain, quote, affected effeminacy, and the Brooklyn Daily Eagle commented that they would not be surprised if New York's sexual underground groups, the Charlotte Anns and the Miss Nancys, quickly embraced Wilde's peculiar tenets. These two groups referred to young men who enjoy the sexual company of other men. And the New York Tribune reported that, quote, pallid and aesthetic young men in dress suits and banged hair could be seen in attendance at Wilde's Chickering Hall lecture. Wilde was already attracting a queer young male fan base who desired to learn about the secrets of aestheticism from him. And the press was already questioning Wilde's queer aesthetic sensibility long before he would be put on trial for engaging in male sodomitical acts in 1895. On January 16, 1882, Wilde left New York City to head down to Philadelphia's Horter Horticultural Hall to talk again about the English Renaissance. As Wilde journeyed by train from Jersey, Z Jersey City down to Philadelphia, a reporter from the Philadelphia Press interviewed him and on January 17th released an article based on their conversation, Talk with Wilde. One of the key moments from this train interview was that Wilde opened up about his love for Whitman in response to the reporter asking, quote, what poet do you most admire in American literature? He told the reporter that, quote, I think that Walt Whitman and Emerson have given the world more than anyone else. I do so hope to meet Mr. Whitman. Perhaps he is not widely read in England, but England never appreciates a poet until he is dead. Wilde is eager to meet his American literary hero, Whitman, when he arrives in Philadelphia, since he knew that Whitman lived across the Delaware River in Camden, New Jersey. 
Wilde followed up his comment to the reporter by emphasizing the intensity of his admiration for Whitman and says that he discusses Whitman with his friends, quote, Dante Rossetti, Algernon Charles Swinburne, and William Morris. He also notes that, quote, there is something so Greek about his poetry. Wilde's identification of Greek themes in Whitman's poetry connects to what he told the Boston Herald about thinking he was in the presence of an ancient Greek when he spent intimate time with Whitman. On January 11th, Stoddart wrote to Whitman that, quote, Oscar Wilde has expressed his great desire to meet you socially, and he will dine with me when I shall be most happy to have you join us, unquote. However, Whitman could not travel to see Wilde in Philadelphia since he had experienced a stroke and his mobility was limited. Wilde did not take no for an answer and made it clear to Whitman that he would eagerly travel to Camden to meet his idol. Whitman responded in a note on January 18th, the day after Wilde delivered his Philadelphia lecture, that if Wilde would like to see him, he could be found at 431 Stephen Street, Camden, between two till three and a half, 3.30 this afternoon, and we'll be most happy to see Mr. Wilde and Mr. Stoddart. Wilde departed the Aldine Hotel where he was staying in Rittenhouse Square with Stoddart and boarded a ferry at Market Street in Philadelphia and made a quick journey across the river to Market Street in Camden. The two walked about 20 minutes to 431 Stephen Street and Wilde's wish became a reality. He would spend more than two hours with Whitman. Whitman was living with his brother, George, and sister-in-law, Louisa, who were taking care of him after his stroke. As Wilde and Stoddard sat down with Whitman, Louisa's homemade elderberry wine was produced, and the three indulged in it as they engaged in a literary discussion. This is when Wilde divulged to Whitman how his mother would read the Leaves of Grass poems to him as a child. Whitman was incredibly flattered and desired to get to know Wilde on a more intimate level. Whitman soon excused himself from Stoddard, and the others gathered in the living room and invi invited Wilde up to his den on the third floor. This more intimate environment was later characterized by Whitman as a place where the two indulged in a, quote, jolly good time, where Wilde could get away from fashionable society and spend time with an old rough. Wilde explained that while in the den, he experienced, quote, the greatest and strongest man who has ever lived. Whitman writes to his friend, Harry Stafford, after meeting Wilde, that he was very impressed with this quote, fine, large, handsome youngster. Whitman called Wilde a quote, splendid boy who is so frank and outspoken and manly. Both men emphasized that their intimate time spent in Whitman's den led to a meaningful and pleasurable male bonding experience. The intimacy that the two men share in Whitman's den is both intellectual and physical, since Whitman and Wilde connect each other's manliness to their literary style. Even though Wilde had only published a selection of poetry, Whitman had commented on how Wilde was already making a name for himself as a literary base for Victorian aestheticism. Wilde knew that he was in the presence of an important literary mentor, since he announced to Whitman that, quote, I have come to you as to one with whom I have been acquainted almost from the cradle, unquote. In his letter to Harry Stafford, Whitman responded that he was pleased that Wilde had, quote, the good sense to take a great fancy to me, unquote. What was it that Wilde desired to learn from Whitman? And why did Wilde categorize Whitman as possessing an ancient Greek aesthetic? The erotic intellectual connection between the men is one that a poet and professor, Helen Gray Cohn, comments on when she creates a fictional poem entitled, quote, Narcissus in Camden. Even after Whitman's death in 1892, Wilde is still thinking about the erotic nature of this meeting when he tells his friends, George Ives and John Addington Simmons, that he could still feel, quote, the kiss of Walt Whitman on my lips. The possibility of this kiss and Whitman's later revelation that the two physically embraced reveals that a special male-male bond was created on January 18, 1882. Because of the differences in their ages, the erotic intellectual nature of their relationship 
makes it a 19th century version of ancient Greek male pederastic love. Wilde's comments about the Greekness in Whitman's poetry and in Whitman's physical appearance opens a slew of questions regarding why Wilde associated Whitman with this ancient Greek tradition. This meeting was so intense that Wilde wrote to Whitman on March 1st, 1882 that quote, before I leave America, I must see you again. There is no one in this wide great world of America whom I love and honor so much, unquote. Not much is known about what happened when Whitman and Wilde reunited on May 10th, 1882, but a Philadelphia humorist of the time, Charles Godfrey Leyland, wrote that before Wilde came to visit with him, he had just come back, quote, fresh from Camden and had spent an hour at the feet of Walt Whitman. This article accurately captures the reverence that Wilde displayed when in Whitman's presence and emphasizes Wilde's desire to learn and gain private knowledge from Whitman. Since Wilde had been reading about Whitman's male comrades from his boyhood to adulthood, perhaps Wilde desired to learn more from Whitman about the beauty of manly love, a theme that Whitman articulated throughout Leaves of Grass. Although ni neither Wilde nor Whitman explicitly discuss this when being interviewed by the press, Wilde gives us a clue when he notices the ancient Greek aspects of Whitman's poetry. Wilde had not yet published his most male homoerotically charged fictive works, The Picture of Dorian Gray, written in 1890, and his poem, The Disciple, 1894, but Whitman recognized in Wilde a similarity in their literary themes and personalities. On January 18th and May 10th, when Whitman and Wilde stared into each other's eyes, they both were reflecting a male homoerotic desire that can be found in their literature and in their biographical lives. What a suggestive queer idea to think that both Whitman and Wilde were engaging in an act of male homoerotic literary cruising with one another. While their age difference reflects that ancient Greek pederastic connection, the mythical connection between them mirrors an ancient Greek male homoerotic myth that represents both male beauty and intellect, the myth of Narcissus. Mm. Mm. This myth is one that becomes foundational for understanding male same-sex desire in both Whitman and Wilde's representations of male homoeroticism. The queer male influence that the myth exerts on Whitman and Wilde differs since Whitman's writing exists before John Addington Simmons and Havelock Ellis, who were Victorian sexologists, developed their 1890 theory of male sexual inversion, an early concept of male homosexuality. The influence of the Narcissus myth and ancient Greek male homoerotic culture and literature on Whitman's 1855 and 1860 editions of Leaves of Grass provides a new way of exploring male homoerotic themes in his poetry. Queer male writers who followed in Whitman's footsteps, like Wilde and Simmons, are influenced by the Narcissus myth's male homoerotic implications, but also by Whitman's representation of male same-sex desire and his vision of comradeship. I argue that Whitman creates a queer male procreative poetics that allows for both contemporary and future queer male readers and writers to enter into a queer community of readers and writers that is united through their reading and rewriting of the Narcissus myth. The trope of the Narcissus myth, which is deployed by both American and British 19th century authors, offers a language to discuss homoerotic male relations that exists before medical writing on sexual orientation. This myth allows for a new language around homoerotic relations to develop before a medica medicalized language for sexual orientation solidified. I focus on how the myth of Narcissus, an ancient Greek male homoerotic culture, influenced Whitman's representation of male same-sex desire, since Whitman is living during a time when society does not yet see sexuality as an identity that is split from gender normative behavior. The Narcissus myth and its male homoerotic influence on Whitman and fellow queer male 19th century American and British writers has been under theorized in queer literary studies. When queer literary scholars do turn to Narcissus, they often neglect the original Greek version of the myth. In this version, Narcissus rejects the admiration and love of his male suitor, Amenius, 
who kills himself in front of Narcissus and then is sentenced by Artemis, goddess of the hunt, to have only himself as a love object. Many will recognize the next part of the myth, since Narcissus falls in love with his own image when he sees it reflected back in a pond and so intensely desires his own image that he falls in the pond and drowns. The myth of Echo and Narcissus is added by the Roman writer Ovid. In this version, Narcissus is so desire, desirous of his own image that he wastes away and dies after ignoring Echo's advances. The homoerotic aspect of the pond derives from Narcissus's love for his own image, which occurs apart from society and is instead a private experience in nature. The pond's surface is a natural element that I am drawn to since it is by the pond that many characters contemplate their sexual and gender roles in society, that in a society that they have been either forced out of or left of their own accord. In Reflecting Narcissus, a queer aesthetic, Stephen Broom briefly touches, touches upon the use of Narcissus as a homoerotic figure to represent male characters' inner feelings of desire towards other men. Broom and other queer critics have not closely examined the deployment of Narcissus by American and British writers to represent male-male desire and sexual relations outside of a psychoanalytic framework. Instead of looking at the period when homosexuality is invented in the field of sexology, I am more interested in how the myth of Narcissus figures as a pre-homosexual figure that allows many Anglo-American authors to explore male-male erotic relations. In my reading Homoerotic Bonds, I draw on Eve Sedgwick's formulations in Between Men and Epistemology of the Closet, both of which introduced ways of thinking about same-sex male desire that existed in 19th century private and public communities without sexual identity categories. When looking specifically at 19th century American homoerotic texts, I draw upon the work of Scott S. Derrick and Peter Coviello, who both discuss queer male literary homoerotic relations through the lens of historicism by examining the cultural and societal shifts in masculine and feminine gender roles. For Derek, the anxiety around the destabilization of dominant masculinity in American society helps to support his argument that canonical American 19th century texts are representative of a masculine anxiety around a restructuring of gender and sex relations. Coviello, on the other hand, looks at the parameters of sex in the US before the Wild trials to provide a new taxonomy for expressing male same-sex desire that resists using an anachronistic term like, quote, homosexuality to label this desire. My major intervention in the field of queer reception studies is what I call queer influence theory. Queer reception studies is primarily concerned with how individual queer, quote, readers are both producers and receivers of a text, unquote. But this definition focuses on individual readers' engagement with a queer text, not a community of queer readers. My formulation of queer influence builds upon queer reception studies and argues that queer readers and writers turn to a particular text, for example, the myth of Narcissus, which actively creates a temporally expansive community. For an understanding of the field of queer reception studies, I turn to Natasha Hurley, Heather Love, and Christopher Nealon to arrive at my theoretical idea of a literary queer influence. Hurley's circulating queerness before the gay and lesbian novel looks at how texts were circulated by the queer community before the rise of the gay and lesbian novel. Like Hurley, my theory of queer influence is interested in how queer readers and writers turn to literary texts to provide language around male homoerotic desire before the concept of male homosexuality existed. For love, literary texts that explore queer negative feelings like pain and shame have been abandoned by queer activists and replaced solely with literary texts that provide affirmative queer messages, such as queer marriage. Love coins the phrase, quote, feeling backward, which opens up conversations around why certain queer characters are socially excluded in, quote, late 19th and early 20th century literary texts, unquote, 
and why these negative feelings of queer suffering are ignored as part of queer history. Similar to love, Nealon and Foundling's Lesbian and Gay Historical Emotion Before Stonewall analyzes early to mid 20th century literary texts that reveal an LGBTQ movement before the Stonewall riots in 1969. My queer influence theory relies on these three queer critics' discussions to explain how Whitman's male homoerotic poetics is influenced by earlier authors, like Francis Wright and ancient Greek texts, to articulate male same-sex desire that resists sexual identity language, like gay, bisexual, or homosexual. The queer influence theory that I outline in my dissertation leads to a nuanced analysis of Whitman's male homoerotic poetics, a poetics that centers on Whitman's vision of comradeship. This vision of comradeship relies on men erotically and intellectually embracing one another. And I argue that this vision is influenced by ancient Greek male homoerotic models of athletic and pederastic culture. This vision of comradeship that Whitman's poetic speaker articulates is a form of queer male procreation. This figurative procreation allows for Whitman's contemporary and future queer male readers to recognize aspects of their own queer male identity, even though Whitman is writing before the category of the homosexual exists. To arrive at this theory of mere queer male procreation, I turn to the queer theorist Lee Edelman and Jose Esteban Munez and their analyses of queer reproduction. Edelman lays out his theory of reproductive futurism in No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, where he explains that heteronormative society upholds the image of, quote, the child as the, as the possibility of the future, against which the queer is positioned as the embodiment of a relentless, narcissistic, antisocial, and future negating drive, unquote. He argues that the power of queerness is that the queer community can refuse this heteronormative reproductive impulse. My concept of queer, queer male procreation differs from Edelman, since I suggest that queer male readers, when encountering Whitman's poetry, engage in an act of male homoerotic desire that is carried from generation to generation. My queer male procreative vision is more aligned with Jose Esteban Munez's theory of queer futurity. In Cruising Utopia, the, met, the then and there of queer futurity, Yunez argues that queer futurity offers, quote, an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future, unquote. My queer male procreative analysis reveals that Whitman's poetry centers queer white male bodies, and a queer of color inter intervention is necessary to question why whiteness and queerness is intertwined in his articulation of comradeship and democracy. Both Julian B. Carter's The Heart of Whiteness, Normal Sexuality and Race in America, 1880 to 1940, and Siobhan B. Somerville's Queering the Color Line, Race and the Invention of Homosexuality in American Culture, provide the necessary queer of color framework to understand how Victorian sexological and racial language excluded queer people of color from same-sex spaces. Okay. Chapter one, Whitman's City of Orgies, begins by tracing Whitman's reading of ancient Greek literature before writing his 1855 Leaves of Grass, a text that deeply influences his thinking on male homoerotic themes in ancient Greek literature is the Scottish philosopher Francis Wright's novel, A Few Days in Athens. Exploring the erotic nature of Wright's novel, which provides a fictional history of Epicurus and his followers, provides a framework for understanding how Wright's intellectual ideas enter into Whitman's homoerotic poetics. Wright's novel, which is set in ancient Athens, follows a young male philosopher, Theon, who is desperate to join a philosophical com community. Before Theon joins Epicurus's community, he hears of scandalous nightly orgies occurring between Epicurus and his young male students. Theon enters Epicurus's circle, nevertheless, 
and learns that Epicurus's philosophy of hedonism is concerned with male homoerotic intellectual orgies, not necessarily physical ones. This plot point makes its way into Whitman's later Calamus poem, which celebrates and delights in, quote, City of Orgies, 1867, is that version of City of Orgies. The first Whitman poem that is influenced by Wright's novel is an unpublished poem called Pictures, written between 1850 and 1851. In Pictures, the speaker leads the reader on a homoerotic journey through ancient Athens and arrives in Whitman's 1851 New York City, where the reader encounters a man, quote, with rapid feet, curious, gay, going up and down Manhattan, through the streets, along the shores, working his way through the crowds, observing and singing. The reader, vis-a-vis -vis the speaker, has effectively time traveled from the gardens of Socrates in fifth century BCE Athens to the mid 19th century streets of Manhattan. The unknown identity of the young man in the picture is soon unmasked when he is referenced again in another picture where he is described as, quote, the celebrated rough of Manhattan. Whitman will refer to his poetic self as, quote, one of the roughs, in his 1855 Song of Myself, but it is in this stanza of pictures that Whitman first uses the adjective rough to describe his appearance. Although not the poet, Whitman, but a poet surrogate, Whitman uses parentheses to reveal the speaker's internal thoughts about this attractive young man gallivanting around Manhattan. The speaker reveals that this man is, quote, the one I love well. Let others sing whom they may, Hear him I sing for a thousand years, unquote. The speaker expresses his passionate love that he feels towards this rough man who is not only painted in a picture, but a man who the speaker has been following through the streets of Manhattan. It is in this poetic act of erotic cruising that Whitman poetically conveys what his early vision of comradeship looks like. The reader is not given a moment to contemplate the complexity of this queer relationship because, Right after the speaker describes the passionate love he has for the poet surrogate, he describes several pictures on the wall. But when he stops at the last picture, he calls out to the reader, quote, but here, look you well, see here the phallic choice of America, unquote. Although the reader was distracted by a few historical pictures, we are again called back to Whitman's homoerotic vision. Unlike other pictures, the speaker fully describes the image that is so full of phallic potency. There stands before the speaker, quote, a full-sized man or woman, a natural well-trained man or woman, unquote. Even if the speaker is not standing before nude bodies, his interpretation of their bodies as, quote, the phallic choice of America, unquote, poetically alludes to the significance of the phallus for the ancient Greeks. The speaker goes on to lay out how the phallic choice of America manifests itself by first starting with what is not included in this idea. To achieve this phallic idea, one must leave, quote, the finesse of cities and all the returns of commerce or agriculture and the magnitude of geography and achievements of literature and art and all the shows of exterior victory, unquote. And by fleeing from these aspects of society, one will be that much closer to enjoying America's phallic energy, an energy that Whitman attaches to the bodies of, quote, breeding full-sized men or one full-sized man or woman, unquote. Whitman's fascination with the virile man in this image serves as a precursor to what he will identify as, quote, the procreant urge of the world in his 1855 Song of Myself. At first glance, this creative energy described as phallic, breeding, and procreant fits into a patriarchal taxonomy, but Whitman specifies that America's phallic choice speaks for all American citizens. Even though the word democracy does not appear in pictures, it is the philosophical idea behind America's phallic choice. Whitman will eventually expand upon why comradeship is needed for America's democratic experiment to survive fully realized in his 1871 Democratic Vistas. 
But here, he is interested in why erotic, specifically phallic energy, is what will begin to heal America's social and cultural divisions. This powerful erotic force is connected to Whitman's vision of homo homoeroticism that is expressed in pictures by Socrates, Socrates' pupils, and the speaker. Pictures is where Whitman first introduces his reader to a homoeroticism where the men share in a bodily, philosophical, aesthetic, and spiritual pleasure. Whitman has created the foundation for how homoeroticism will poetically appear in these different forms in his 1855 and 1860 editions of Leaves of Grass. Pictures provides the blueprint Whitman needs to experiment his vision of comradeship, which becomes inextricably linked to his ideas on democracy. In pictures, Whitman lays the poetic foundation for looking towards classical Athens for representing homoeroticism in mid 19th century America. Chapter two, Whitman's phallic choice of America opens by how exploring in pictures, Whitman articulates a form of democratic homoeroticism that places the common man at the center of democracy. This is problematic in regards to racial representation since white maleness is at the center of Whitman's idea of democracy. While pictures provides the foundation for Whitman's male homoerotic poetics, it is in Song of Myself where a link between male homoerotic desire and democracy is firmly established. While I am not the first Whitman scholar to draw attention to Whitman's use of ancient Greek myth and culture to establish his male homoerotic poetics, the majority begin their analysis with his Calamus poems and not Song of Myself or the even earlier pictures. At the end of my chapter, I argue that in Song of Myself, Whitman offers a queer procreative urge that exists in a liminal space in between autoerotic and procreative desire, where queer men erotically connect with one another. Chapter three. I'll let you take this in. Okay, chapter three. Whitman Cruz's Narcissus, a queer procreative poetics, begins with the song of myself male speakers focus on the male body and the power of the phallus, a focus that would seem to largely negate the experience of female sexuality. Phallic language throughout Song of Myself contains allusions to ancient Greek culture, specifically the Dionysian festivals, philosophical pederastic culture as exemplified by Plato, and warrior culture with Achilles and Patroclus's love. The male speaker in Song of Myself moves from a narcissist-like autoerotic journey to a queer male procreative one when he is joined by the bedfellow. I argue that Whitman moves away from the narcissist myth to the calamus myth in order to affirm male-male desire. The queer male procreative vision that Whitman presents centers on queer white male bodies, and I turn to queer of color theory to address why white male bodies are idolized, but black male bodies are fetishized. Then I address the question of the absence of women in Whitman's male homoerotic poetics and complicate it by questioning who the woman is in the 28 bathers section. Section 11 of Song of Myself begins with the speaker observing that, quote, 28 young men bathe by the shore, 28 young men and all so friendly, 28 years of womanly life and all so lonesome. She owns the fine house by the rise of the bank. She hides handsome and richly dressed aft the blinds of the window. Which of the young men does she like the best? Ah, the homeliest of them is beautiful to her, unquote. This is the first time a, a woman has both entered and been given a limited voice in Whitman's male homoerotic community. Her voice is limited here since the reader hears her voice through third person narration. As her imaginative participation continues in this nude male space, I argue that Whitman will not grant her full agency. She is trying to re remain inconspicuous as she voyeuristically gazes at the young men who are splashing and frolicking in the water. The speaker then questions the woman and asks, quote, where are you off to, lady? You splash in the water there, yet stay stock still in your room, unquote. This suggests that the woman is imaginatively splashing with the 28 bathers. 
The speaker then categorizes the woman as, quote, the 29th bather, who is invisible to the 28 young men, but she can see, quote, the beards of the young men glistening with wet, unquote, quote. Her observation that the young men have beards emphasizes that they no longer belong to the world of ancient Greek pederastia, since they are neither the Arastes or the adult bearded man, or the Aramanos, the beardless youth. It is as if the anonymous woman has metamorphosed, like an ancient Greek myth, into one of the bearded young men, since she is able to describe not only their glistening wet beards, but also, quote, little streams of water passing all over their bodies, unquote. The woman's ability to be invisible to these young men allows her to enter this exclusively male space so she can enjoy the beauty of the water reflecting on any, every inch of these young male bodies. The woman has taken on an erotic gaze since she is looking the young men up and down as if she is cruising them. She is only given access to eroticize these young men since the men cannot see her. As Jack Parlett explains, male homoerotic cruising is a quote, profoundly optical phenomenon, a perceptual arena where acts of looking are intensified and eroticized, unquote. But the cruising that happens with the woman and the 28 bathers is not reciprocal, since only the woman is able to erotically look at each of the young men. After the woman sees the water streaming down the bodies of the men, the poem takes a dramatic turn since the woman is no longer mentioned again by the speaker. The last time the woman is directly referenced by the speaker is when he calls her the 29th bather. And he explains to the reader that she is imaginatively able to both see and love the young men while the carefree noon men cannot see her, the speaker can, since he is the one describing the woman and her rich, richly dressed body to the reader. He knows that she can only imagine what it must feel like swimming nude with the young men because she has to remain stock still in her room. Once she imagines the erotic beauty of the water enveloping the nude young male bodies, and specifically how it looks on their beards, then the shift in the poem happens. The speaker says that, quote, an unseen hand also passed over there, the young men, bodies. It descended tremblingly from their temples and ribs, unquote. At first, it might seem that this unseen hand could belong to the woman, but the woman is only able to erotically imagine being among the young men, not physically touch their temples and ribs. This unknown figure takes the place of the woman's erotic gaze, since they now see, quote, the young men float on their backs, their white bellies swelling to the sun, unquote. The young men, quote, do not ask who seizes fast to them. They do not know who puffs and declines with pendant and bending arch. They do not think whom they souse with spray, unquote. These 28 young men are part of a male community that does not judge whom they souse, soak, or drench with their spray. Whitman does not explicitly state that the young men are engaging in an orgy with one another, but these young male bathers are experiencing an intense state of pleasure. They do not care whom they drench with their male spray, a spray that takes on a sexual tone since their male bodies are floating and their white bellies are swelling. Both phallic, the swelling, and ejaculatory, the male spray, imagery is present in the bather's section. Whitman reveals that these young men are white and their white bellies are swelling because the men are floating on their backs. But Whitman leaves the possibility that it is not just their bellies that are swelling, but also their penises, which are pointing towards the sun. The image of the men's white bellies also evokes the swollen belly of a pregnant woman. This swelling is part of Whitman's queer male procreative poetics, since both phallic, the men's erections, and procreative, their pregnant bellies, images are possible here. The chapter concludes by suggesting how ancient Greek male homoerotic desire, pederastia, the Narcissus myth, and the Calamus myth encompasses two different aspects of Whitman's queer male procreative poetics, homoerotic pain and homoerotic pleasure. In Song of Myself, the male spe speaker experiences both pain and pleasure when he is joined in orgiastic bliss with his bedfellow, but then immense pain when his bedfellow leaves him. While Whitman's queer male procreative poetic 
poetics relies on the influence of ancient Greek mythology, Whitman subverts the ending of these myths since his male speaker lives and does not follow Narcissus, Achilles, Patroclus, Carpus, or Calamus into death. I expand my queer male procreative poetics argument by turning to Whitman's most explicit male homoerotic verse found in Calamus 1860 and look at how cruising functions as a homoerotic poetic mode. The conclusion, cruising with comrades, moving from homoerotic pain to homoerotic pleasure, begins with a close reading of Sarah Vandershaft's recent play, Whitman's Warnings, to illuminate how cruising is a homoerotic poetic mode found throughout Calamus. I build on Jack Parlett's theory of cruising, specifically its male homoerotic potentiality, to argue that cruising as a poetic mode in Whitman's Calamus creates two divergent pathways, homoerotic pain and homoerotic pleasure. My argument about Whitman's queer male procreative poetic vision relies on this nuanced reading of cruising in Calamus since it helps to articulate how Whitman's queer male readers interpret male homoerotic themes in Whitman's poetry and see their own identity reflected back in it. I turn to Simmons' over 20-year letter-writing relationship with Whitman and address Simmons' questions regarding the male homoerotic themes in Whitman's poetry. While Whitman scholars always point to Simmons' letter of August 3rd, 1890, where he asked Whitman about the possibility of the male sexual invert being represented in his poetry, Simmons first addresses male homoeroticism with Whitman in a letter dated on February 7th, 1872. Whitman does not reject Simmons' male homoerotic interpretation of intense manly love found in Calamus the 1872 letter, but he fully rejects any use of his poetry that will lead to men engaging in criminal male sodomitical acts, the 1890 letter. Whitman does not want Simmons' Victorian sexo sexological language to be used as a critical lens that interprets the male speaker as a sexual invert. But instead of distancing himself from Simmons, Whitman continues corresponding with Simmons up until his death in 1892. Whitman never rejects Simmons' queer male identity, nor the possibility for male homoerotic themes that exist outside of a sexological framework, an attempt to read Whitman or the speaker as an early form of the male homosexual. Simmons' Walt Whitman is Study, 1892, builds on Whitman's vision of comradeship and Simmons explicitly confirms that this vision represents male same-sex desire. Simmons' recognition of his queer male identity when reading Whitman's poetry acts as a figurative queer male procreative relationship and brings us back to the queer male influence Whitman held over Wilde. Whitman's queer influence on Wilde can be deeply felt when Wilde reimagines the Narcissus myth in his poem, The Disciple, 1894, and The Picture of Dorian Gray, 1890. The desire of Whitman's male calamus speaker to spread his queer male procreative vision comes to fruition in both Simmons and Wilde's work. Simmons would not have been able to argue for an early model of male homosexuality without Whitman's male homoerotic poetics and its expansive view of male same-sex desire. Once Simmons introduces this term, the male homosexual, with the help of Havelock Ellis, he ushers in a new era of queer male readers who have been inspired and influenced by Whitman's male homoerotic poetics. But that development reaches beyond the scope of this dissertation. And with that, thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>